Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie uh, Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with knife maker Alex Steingraber, who first joined us on episode number 146. Now, in a short time, Alex and his Steingraber performance knives have become known for their super thin grinds, exotic steels, and dialed-in heat treatments. His debut knife, the Shark created a lot of buzz for its blend of really refined EDC properties in a small and easily carried fixed blade package. Now, I missed out on, on a drop that Alex himself uh, gave me a heads up on, uh, like a like a like a like a dunce. Uh, but I finally lucked into a crewware shark on the secondary market, and it quickly earned a spot among my favorite EDC fixed blades. And I love to carry fixed blades. Uh, but Steingraber Performance Knives is on the threshold of something big, something exciting. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and then download us wherever you listen to podcasts, because this whole thing can be found on audio. So if you can't watch the whole thing on uh, YouTube, you can download us and uh, listen on your way to work or whilst doing dishes. Uh, and then you can join us on Patreon where you can help support the show if that interests you. And there are a number of different uh, levels of support and you get, uh, well, you get exclusive content and other perks and a chance to win a knife every month. So check it out by going to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. Hey, Alex, welcome to the show. Good to see you again. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Do I sense a, a little more gray in the beard since last uh, last we spoke? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know what? Knife making is taking a toll on me, so... <laughs> So uh, be before we get into what I really, the reason I really invited you back on the show, something that I've been observing, uh, kind of watching develop on Instagram. I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about, but uh, that's what I really want to talk to you about. But just in case people had, didn't listen to the first show, just let me know how you got into knife making and how in such a quick time you were uh, able to uh, come up with a design like this and then be able to execute like this. Yeah, so I started actually back in, I want to say, roughly 2017, 2018, um, fiddling around in the garage, and then it progressed because I was also getting into the knife community at that point, and then a buddy of mine on Reddit was like, hey, you should make a knife at a K390, and I was like, all right, I'll just do that, so... <laughs> Got some steel and uh, formulated a design and then made two knives called, they were actually called the Great White, like a Great White Shark. And um, and then I was like, oh, it'd be cool if I had like, you know, a Mako Shark and a Great White Shark and all these other sharks. And then I made four more knives, two out of, I think, K390 and then two out of LMAX. And it was the LMAX ones were kind of like the Mako type thing or like the smaller of the two. And then I basically, after those sold or whatever, I am, um, sorry, there's like a little light thing here. Um, I kind of like laid one template on top of the other and kind of like was just playing around with it and took out one area of, the great white shark and then left some features of the mako and then um that yeah, it just evolved into the shark oh, and I then heard. yeah so you had the you had the great white you had the mako you took the best from both and distilled it into the shark the the shark is um i mean this is this is a knife that i talk about a lot since i've gotten it uh, if, when I first got it, of course, I, I talked about it all the time, but um, it's a great chore knife, not to mention the fact that if you like to carry EDC uh, fixed blades, which I do, it's very good and discreet. Uh, and, and I carry this in a way I don't carry any other knife, which is horizontally right on the front next to my belt buckle. 
and it's short enough that it kind of blends in if you have a sweater or anything on. Um, but it's it's a great, great cutter. Yeah, so that was another thing is I wanted to make it at least that design really thin because the other ones were basically when I sent things out for heat treat, I, I sent things to Peter's and mm-hmm. they specifically say on their website, you know, 20 thousands, keep it at that. And I was like, okay. But then also being in the knife community, you know, looking at other, what other people were experimenting with and reading other books and stuff like that. I was like, yeah, but I want to go way thinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it just, I realized that I had to like learn how to heat treat. I had to learn how to grind thinner in a safe manner, meaning not ruining the heat treat. And that's the direction I wanted to go in with all of this. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it it's ever evolving. It's never not finished for me with any design. I just want to keep making it better. So yeah, I mean, shark 2.0 for sure at some point, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of how I got in into all of this without getting into super detail, but yeah, I really like the, I like the design of the shark. I like that it's small enough. You can actually carry it in your front pocket as well, mm-hmm. given different carry options and stuff like that. But yeah, I've had nothing but, you know, happy, happy users for sure. Well, uh, one thing you can do with this knife in particular when it's in the front pocket is snag the uh, the thumb flare on the front of your jean, you know, on the pocket, and then just pull out and just have the blade, which so is like an know, Emerson wave kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's like a fixed bladed wave. Um, so something that that impressed me about you from the beginning was uh, that you were using these exotic steels, these super steels, and to me. Uh, I just sort of assumed that someone new or a relatively new would would stick to the I don't know the the less difficult to grind steels, but you kind of jumped right in. Yeah, I have a habit of doing that. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a minute too. But um, yeah, I have a habit of uh, just diving right into the most difficult thing I can think of and just either nailing it the first time or learning as I go. And that's definitely what I've learned from all these different steels is that they don't act the same. They certainly don't grind the same. I mean, anywhere is from, you know, 4V to Rex 121, I've heat treated it and ground it. So um, yeah, I, <laughs> I think there's a lot of reward with learning that way learning by failures i guess not so much but i mean yeah learning learning by failure trial by error i guess sure so well and and well and trial by fire or whatever but but from what i uh can discern from (laughs) watching you on instagram is that you're very methodical i mean it takes a while to figure out how each steel gets heat treated on its own you know uh optimally uh for that specific steel and i kind of i feel like i like you cataloged the process of figuring all that out and once you have figured that out it's in it's under your skin right yeah and that's another thing too is people don't well i i may have shown it in the in the past but when you get a new steel or a new melt um you want to test it meaning you want to heat treat a little coupon and you want to test it to see where things fall, um, how it, how it acts, I guess. Mm -hmm. And there's not, I mean, now there, there is, you know, quite a bit of data out there, but there's still not that much data, if that makes sense. Like there's data, but there's not a ton of data. And then most of the data you get are from, you know, guys that have taken that risk on blade forums and stuff and have their own little anecdotal things and, you know, reading about Phil Wilson and how he just like was like, you know, a man of his time basically is like using all of these steels and working with the steel companies. And, you know, then you got guys like triple B that are just like taking it to a whole nother level and super nerding out and all the stuff. And it's, it's great. 
And um, I would love to do all of that, but I also want to, you know, run my business and stuff like that. So learning, you know, some of these little tips and tricks from these guys, but then also doing things in a manner where I can, you know, keep things repeatable, I guess, is, yeah. is the way to go. Well, I, you, you just basically answered something I was going to ask you, maybe. And that is, how has being someone who's uh, business conscious, at least, right? You're, you're kind of an entrepreneurial, uh, you've got kind of an entrepreneurial uh, spirit to you, uh, uh, from what I know of you. And, and how has that and, and your um, a, a knowledge of how to run a business and your focus on running a business, how has that uh, affected your knife making and your designing? Um, I mean, I started making knives before I became like businessy, mm. but getting more into the business, it's, it's definitely affected the way I approach things and the way, um, I mean, like, for instance, the thing we're going to talk about in a second, definitely that, like, a lot of these companies that have started out, or not started out, have been around for a while, like, you know, Chris Reeve and, and Medford and Emerson, these guys all started exactly where I did. So you kind of either have to call them on the phone and ask them, or you have to just figure it out. And I'm have a mortal fear of just cold calling people and asking them for all this information and <laughs> getting rejected. So I'm like, I'll just figure it out until I actually need a ton of help. But, uh, it, it's definitely, it's definitely shaped the way that I am going to, or I have, and, and I'm going to approach all of this stuff in the future. It seems uh, kind of evident in your, um, uh, iteration and reiteration of the shark and the sasquatch your your second big model <clears throat> and uh in your uh kind of like chris reeve and kind of like uh the other companies you mentioned but especially chris reeve uh, you know with a limited catalog of designs you have the opportunity of really really perfecting and dialing it in and i don't i'm not sure what run my particular shark comes from it's a crew where i think you determined it was maybe the second run uh, from the look of the handle, but, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, very, very quickly dialed in. And each time you make it, I imagine it, it gets more and more, you know, perfected. And, and that's a way that you can more quickly make more of them and sell more of them. Right. Right. Yeah. That was, uh, one thing that I wanted to take away from other companies is like, uh, constant quality control is like, if there's any issues in this batch, go to the second one and fix all of those and then release them and then see what, you know, see what feedback I get from customers or whomever. And then the next batch fix that. The only thing I don't like about that is that, you know, I didn't get to fix it before they spent their money on it. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> um, but again, you know, the secondary market is, is, is nice to a lot of you know different different knife models and stuff like that and yeah. people can kind of get the return on investment and stuff like that so it it doesn't really it doesn't really bum me out as much but still i'd, I'd like it to be as perfect as possible and then when something comes back just be like something like super simple like you know just change the shape a little bit on the next one and be like okay right 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 it, so it's a constant slight tweaking um, okay. So, so tell us what you're working on right now. You got something big in the, in the works. So yeah, right now I am working on a folding knife. It is called the Lamia. It is Greek, uh, for, uh, Lamia. I mean, it's a Greek demon if you're into Greek mythology. Um, basically the story behind her, um, is, she was having an affair with Zeus, got kicked out of the uh, the Lightning Mountain or whatever the whatever it's called Olympus and uh, <laughs> Olympus, yes, <laughs> um, and uh, was cursed by uh, Zeus's wife, and basically she Zeus's wife killed all of her children, Lumia's children, 
and then cursed her. And so Lamia went around just, you know, devouring children and would have constant nightmares. So to remedy this, Zeus gave her the ability to take her eyes out. So it's like really dark and <laughs> Love really <those> crazy <laughs> for the first for the first knife model, but I wanted it to be sort of a transformation in in words of what the shark was to what it is evolving into now. And a lot of the features from the shark have been brought over to the Lamia. A lot of the um, the agronomics of the shark have been brought over to that. And the thinness of the blade has been brought over. And I think it's going to be, you know, I mean, I think and I don't know at the same time, but I think it'll be it'll be great once I dial things in to where I'm comfortable releasing things out to the wild, but it's um it's definitely taken a long time over over two years of designing and you know countless hours as everyone has seen on on Instagram of just you know obtaining a machine and learning as I go CNC and figuring out, you know, fit tolerances and all this other stuff and just things that they don't tell you on blade forums and things that you need to figure out on your own and things that you need to ask machinists, like actual machinists about. Um, Cause there's really, there's the knife way, knife maker way of machining. And then there's the actual machinist way of machining. Mm. And I don't know either. So I was like, I'm just, I'm just going to figure out a new way. And that's what I did with this. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm working on right now. And I can show you if you want. Yeah. Well, so, okay. so, uh, I mean, there are so many, so many <laughs> questions, but I mean, how did you even, uh, did you have any help or how did you, how did you go from fixed blade uh, mind frame in terms of uh, in terms of creativity in the shop or in terms of just engineering in the shop to uh, that very complex everything uh, of a folder so it was weird because like i growing up i didn't like my grandfather was a machinist for all my life and i didn't really learn anything from him because i was so little um and I had like, there was this one dude in the knife community that I chat with and I was like, Hey man, like, can you throw my shark design into CAD or I mean, cam, no, not cam CAD. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And, um, he's like, yeah. So then I, you know, mm -hmm. compensated him with a knife and, you know, took care of all that. And I was like, I gotta learn how to do this because I just can't keep like, I don't want to bug people and I just want to learn how to do it. So I learned how to do it with like the shark handles. So at that point, when things were progressing, I was like, I have to make scales while I'm making knives or this is not going to be sustainable. So I got a, like a table router, learned how to program it, learned how to program cam and YouTube basically. Mm -hmm. And then at one point I like wanted to know prices of machines because I only knew pricing from what I saw on the internet, like eBay and stuff. And I was like, I wonder what, like, I don't want to deal with a used machine. I wonder what a brand new one is. Can't be that much. And then I got price quotes and I was like, good Lord, <laughs> that is more than some houses cost. Mm, 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 mm. So then I was like, all right, sign me up. Like, <laughs> let's, let's figure this out. Let's see how we can get a new one. So I was established enough where I talked to banks and they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it. Don't worry. And you know, I was not blessed with, you know, a bunch of money. So I had to go to the bank. They're like, yep, here you go. Is your business real? And I was like, yes, it's real. Come check it out. So they checked it out. They're like, yep. All right. You're good. Here's a bunch of money. Go do whatever you got to do. Just we'll take out the money every month to pay for it. I was like, all right, cool. So at that point I was in another transition. The housing market here was like hot. So I was like, oh, I could sell my house and then move into a shop and then 
just figure out the rest. And so down the road, like a mile down the road, there was this like building and I'd drive by it almost every day. And I was like, oh, that'd be cool to like own a shop like that. And fast forward, I contacted a guy that owned that building or owns that building. And I spoke with him and he was also in the manufacturing industry or is in the manufacturing industry. Super awesome guy. And he rented me a space. And then I was like, by the way, I have a machine coming. <laughs> like it's ready to be delivered here. And he's like, all right, let's figure it out. So like we knocked down part of a wall in the building and like, he was super like, he's like, yeah, let's just get this going, man. Let's do it. He's like, I can tell you're going to, you're going to do big things. Let's go. So we knocked down a wall and like got the machine in. And then from then on, I was like, just in learning mode, like learning as I go, watching YouTube, talking to friends, meeting new people online about how to do all this stuff. And here we are. <laughs> so what, how do you feel? You know, you go from, you go from, uh, years uh, since 2017 just hand making knives from scratch uh and then learning heat treating and and you know uh, gradually other you're accumulating skills but now you take this quantum leap not only in the design of a folder but also uh the machine the new shop uh cad cam and all this How, if you compare the uh, let's call it the handmade days versus these new uh broader spectrum days uh what do you what are your feelings about the comparison there so i've thought about this a lot and i've talked to a lot of friends in the machining industry about it people that also work on knives and um you know back in the day when i was like you know hand grinding all this stuff and i was like man this is such a pain in the ass but gotta get it done and i would get things done fairly quickly but now it's like you go from this thing that's pretty rudimentary to just a whole new thing that people actually go to college for <laughs> and try to learn all this stuff. And you have YouTube, basically, I would say that machining knives and I'm talking folders, not fixed blades, because fixed blades, I could probably bang out a fixed blade pretty quickly versus a machine. Mm -hmm. I would say folders <clears throat> are 1000 times harder to do on CNC than if you had just a bridge port and, you know, a really nice drill press and all that stuff. Um, only because, well, from my experience is like, I'm not a machinist and I know machinists that are doing this and they even have trouble doing it. And there's a lot of fixturing involved. There's a lot of making sure things are located properly. There's a lot of, you know, you're cutting different materials, you're designing things in, in cam, and or I mean CAD, and then you're programming it in CAM. And then if, you know, this one thing doesn't go around this corner the way you want it to, you have to draw another line and basically tell the program, no, I want to go this way sort of thing. So it's a lot of, I don't know, I've, I've thought long and hard about this and no disrespect to people that make knives, you know, the old school way, it's, this is a lot harder. Um, probably not physically, but definitely on your psyche and mentally, it's mm. a lot harder. Uh, is that because it's not intuitive to you? Like uh, it's maybe it's more mathematical than it is uh, physics and actually, sculpting. Actually, there's, it's a ton of basic math, but the thing is, is that you're trying to, well, A, you're trying to figure out like your feeds and speeds. You'll hear that a lot, feeds and speeds. And the companies that create the end mills will give you a baseline. And that's all that is, is a baseline to get you started to where your end mill will not break. Now, if you want to go faster, that's up to you to figure out. So it's kind of like heat treating in a way where you're testing the waters. Mm -hmm. And because I've ne never worked in a machine shop, I don't know what a machine is supposed to feel or sound like when it's cutting certain materials. So I've been fortunate enough to get in touch with a tooling rep and the guy that works there has worked in a machine shop all his life and went to school for material sciences. So he's like kind of 
coming over and helping with some feeds and speeds sometimes. And he's like, yeah, you're fine. He's like, you can go way faster than this. Like you can do this. Like, so it's nice in that regard. But for me, just like being alone and being like, well, I guess that's okay. Nothing's breaking. The machine isn't like, you know, the spindle isn't overpowered. So I guess we're good. But then he comes in and he's like, you can go way faster. You'll be fine. The tool's fine. Okay. Okay. So maybe this a thousand times more difficult <laughs> Uh, on the psyche thing is because it's maybe a, still a little raw and new to you and you have this machine that costs as much yes. as your house. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. But, but, but seemingly it will speed up your process, obviously, you, or you wouldn't be doing it. Um, well, yeah, yeah because it's repeatable. Because, and, and, and that's the thing is like, once I personally get comfortable or if I ever hire on somebody that is in that profession, is comfortable, then, then it won't be so daunting as far as you know trying to figure things out it's just like oh yeah we did this on the other other model let's just do it on this one and just change some things here right. but um but yes it's and i imagine it's the same thing everyone else went through that owns a knife company is like they get they all started out with like you know basic things or like an old bridge for and then they moved into cnc so they also had learning curves because I know I listened to an interview with Rick Hinderer. Like, he's like, I didn't know anything about that, so I had to figure it out. And now he has like, you know, ten machines and is just cranking out knives, right. and he barely even like has to deal with any of that stuff anymore. So, it is possible, and it's definitely something that I enjoy. As far as like, the knives are great thing that i enjoy to create and make and use but then machining is like a whole nother level of like you can nerd out on all that stuff and i do that on a daily basis too because it's like you're creating this art with a robot that cannot see and has no idea where it's at and then you have to tell it what to do you have to guide it to cut this material that it has no idea what it is and it's just like a crazy, like sentient being that you're controlling. <laughs> and if you control it correctly, it works out well. Well, you, you got to start uh, talking nice to this thing and giving it the good <laughs> oil, man. <laughs> you want some good. So I noticed you had something in your hand, Alex. Uh, and for those of you who are not, who are not oh, watching, but are listening. No, no, no. The other hand. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look at this. Oh, let, let me get that frame. So this is the uh, Lamia, and you'll notice some features of it um, that come from the shark. So most of the scale design came from the shark. This kind of little back end came from the shark and kind of the swoopy down area. The blade height is thinner. I believe the blade length is three points. I want to say 3.6 inches. And then the handle is longer, so you can get that oop, full grip. And then you have that kind of little nub back there. This way, it's a little awkward, but um, we'll uh, cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, it runs on phosphor uh, bronze, bronze phosphor bearings, TV washers, not bearings, washers. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um the uh hardware we have uh t15 and t10 um and then a milled pocket clip and a milled backspacer pretty you know basic but um all of the uh i don't know if we can get a close up but uh, all the texturing oops, here is not it's not a chamfer like you'll see a lot of like just a flat slab of titanium and then cham hard chamfer, like uh -huh. a 50 thou chamfer. Right. This is all uh, contoured out with a, a ball end mill. <sighs> to Cause there's like an, there's like a weird, a weird radius that I wanted to get that I couldn't get it with a chamfer. So I was like, well, I gotta use a ball end mill and just go it around it. So basically the, the surface of a chamfer is flat, but your the surface of what you have there is radius. Um, like ever so radius like it's a very subtle radius i didn't want a hard chamfer because i wanted it to be able to like 
I, I know when you tumble it, it'll wear down, but like, I just mm-hmm. wanted it to be a certain way. And the way I designed it, I just wanted it to be that way. Um, and I also left the uh, milling, I don't know if you can pick it up, but uh, I left the milling in there. So there's like a step down, but it's all even all the way around on both sides. So it gives it a little micro milling texture, I guess. Right. And then this little cutout here. And then the oh, cutout for the, the lock bar. And then the lock bar is very thin. So there is some flexure to it. And I've that's something I've been, you know, dealing with <clears throat> and also have been finding mean- out that it's like it, it flexes up a little oh, bit. Up and down. Okay. Just because this well, this cutout right here is uh, uh, one sixteenth of an inch, so if I made that thinner, it wouldn't flex as much. And there's other tricks and stuff that knife makers use to to stop flexure. It happens on you know CRKTs and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. I don't find it a flaw, and I don't find it a feature, but I want to get rid of it at some point. So that's something I'll definitely be working on. Um, but yeah. Anode. So that's another thing I had to learn how to anodize. I have no idea how to do that. So, <laughs> and uh, and no uh, no hardware on that clip. I got to say, um, this is really yeah. uh, a beautiful, um, beautiful knife. I'm so glad it's three point six inches. It's like the perfect size, and it's got that perfect handle shape of the uh, of the shark. The blade is beautiful, elongated. I think the overall. Um, uh, uh, profile of the whole thing when it's open, it already looks like a classic, but it doesn't look like anything else except the shark a little bit. It's a little evocative of the shark, <laughs> but that's about it. I, I think this is uh, very exciting. How many of these have you made so far? So this one right here, I guess you would consider it the working prototype. I've been just fitting everything into this and just seeing what I need to change in the in the past few weeks. I, as far as, you know, quantity, I have 15 of them that I've machined out. I just need to machine the blades and the backspacers and the clips. Um, I've sent material out to get double disc ground and waiting on that to come back to work on that stuff. What's double disc ground? So double disc grinding is a process where you will thin down material, but instead of a traditional, like, giant blanchard grinder which is a giant grinder with a big head that spins and it just hogs material off this is Mm -hmm. you flip it and it grinds this way and it takes material off of both sides but you can get fairly precise um and not as precise as some people think but you know within three thousandths of an inch to a thousandth of an inch depending on the size of the material from what i'm told um, I use a company that's a local to me that apparently almost most knife companies use, mm. which is the, co- the company's called Nifty Bar, if anyone wants to look it up. But I know Grimsmo used to use them and a bunch of other companies used to use them. Um, the only thing is, yeah, is that it it doesn't have to be super like at least not yet. It doesn't have to be super like within a few tenths or whatever mm-hmm. of thickness and all that other stuff. It's like they've, they hit a thou like give or take across the part or across the piece that I sent them. And I was fine with that. I also told them to go tighter than that. And they're like, well, that's all we can hit is a thou. And I was like, all right. And got it back. And so anyway, I'm waiting for that material to come back to machine the rest of the components for and all then- the other knives presumably you would take it the rest of the way right if you if you if you wanted it thinner right oh yeah yeah for sure so as far as this like this blade was all machined on the machine this bevel was done on the machine so what blade steel are you are you are you going to be using on these and are are you going to have different um i mean i know this is still at the early stage but what are your plans for the steel and then in general like what are your plans for how you want uh this project to evolve over time i w- i've been thinking a lot about that as far as the steel it's there's not it's not going to change as far as what steels i use i'm going to go i guess all 
shark on it, but it's not going to be in the same regard as like I'm doing this steel drop. It's just, okay. I'm going to buy a bunch of steel and then just start making, you know, throwing blades in these knives. And then as they go up, if you want that one, you gotta, you know, you gotta get it um, down the road. I definitely want to separate it by steel category, but it's right now it's just like with the scarcity of a lot of steels that people want and, you know, just me also learning as I go, it's just not feasible to just, you know, do a giant drop of like just one steel. I just need to grab a bunch of different steels and just push it through. And then also I'm testing it at the same time to see how it responds to heat treat because I, like I said, I'm machining all of these off the machine and then I'm heat treating them after, which, you know, give or take, um, you know, whatever way you want to do it. But the uh, rule of thumb is 20 thousandths of an inch. But now I recently read on Peter he Peter's heat treating website that it's 15 thousand. So is that so it doesn't I, um, warp? It, it, are yeah. you saying so it does, Okay, so you can grind down the blade to about 20 thousandths or 15 thousandths uh, yep. thick before, uh, and, and then safely heat treat it before you can expect that blade to warp on you. Correct. Um, so then that's have, when you would take it the rest of the way with your grinder. Right. Um, but I have one that I tested out in 4V that I, I machined it 12 thousandths. And he oh. treated it and I got zero warping. So oh, nice. I'm going to see how far down I can go. Um, it's not going, this probably isn't going to be as thin as the shark, but it's definitely going to be thin as I guess, big name production knives like Benchmade and Spider Co and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to do some hand ground versions to get super thin and offer those as well so i'm not you know i'm not a stranger to to the grinding wheel so it's definitely something i want to do um but i also want to get the machine dialed in to where these are consistent and as far as you know quote unquote surface finishes i think i'm going to take a risk and leave the milling on the blade and just kind of blast it in with the blade. Because if you look at like a Benchmade or a, any big name production knife, they have grind lines on them that are mm -hmm. basically a CNC grinder ground those lines and they go vertically. So these are just horizontally. I don't know if you can see it, but you definitely cannot feel it at all. You can only see it. So I don't think it's something that I think it's something that adds to the to the essence of this came from a machine. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that it came from a machine. And then if I grind one, I want people to know that I ground it sort of thing. I got you. But it but it's not just uh, for it's uh, for symbolizing how it was made. It's also it's also got to be an aesthetic choice, I would imagine, because though I can't see on the camera here, I've seen other um, blades that have various mill lines in it, and, and it can be very, uh, very much a part of the look and very attractive, you know, and um, right. Yeah. Like, like take for instance, like uh, the Norseman that has yes, the yeah. step, the step marks in it. So these would have the same step marks. Um, my step over is about three tenths of an inch. So every three tenths of an inch, it steps over and, it's super smooth. Um, but as far as visual right off the machine, it may not be appealing to some, it may be appealing to some, but you know, we have blasting medias and tumblers and stuff like that. So you kind of blend everything. So it looks nice. Um, so when yeah. you were designing this knife and, and coming up with uh, what you wanted it to be, what were your, design priorities and how did you i mean i know you wanted to basically translate the shark but in terms of a folder what do you appreciate in a folder and what did you want this to be i know i know i wanted like the opening to be some sort of hole or opening just because it's just something that i've i've clicked with as far as the way i open knives i've never been a fan of thumb studs 
and that's just a personal preference. I just, I'd rather have a hole versus a thumb stud. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the only major thing other than I, I was going to do this all in aluminum, but then I realized, and after research that aluminum probably wouldn't be the great greatest idea for two scales. If it were an integral, probably mm -hmm. like if it were just one piece, but, um, this is the main thing is just having some sort of hole. Now this hole can evolve over time for sure. But, um, as far as everything else, I had no idea how to, that this is my first knife design. Um, I've taken apart a lot of knives and I guess that I didn't really pay attention as much as some people do or don't when you take apart a knife. Cause you're like, Oh, it's, Oh yeah. It's just like this angle. And then this thing sits on here and blah, blah, blah. But if you actually like break it down and like, look, each knife has its own unique, like tang angle. And like, there's a positive or negative rake on the lock face. And even the lock face could be, you know, turn different angles and stuff like that. So it's like all these things that you learn as you go or, Cause like, there's a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, just throw on a 7.5 degree on the tang and you should be fine. And I'm like, okay. And then you do it and it fails and you're like, oh, well that didn't work. So now what? And they're like, I don't know. That's what everyone else says. And it's just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it then, just doesn't you know, seem like that should translate directly from one <laughs> person's design to another. And, and, you know, I didn't even think about it until I was getting into the whole lock thing. And then you know, reading excerpts from Bob Trusula's book is like, yeah, 7.5 to 8.5, you're fine. And then, you know, talk and then looking at other guys that have made knives are like, no, it's actually six degrees to, you know, nine degrees. And it's just like, it could be anywhere in there. And they're like, my preference is this. So you got to figure it out. And I'm like, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. And then also on top of it, because the blade stock is a hundred thousand seven inch thick, there is like, there is no area to really lock up on. So you're getting 40 to 50% lock up and it has to, it has to fit somewhere in there. So I had to basically figure out what rake angle to use for the 7.5 degrees. And I mean, it may change in the future. I may drop it down to six just to get a little bit more bite in there, but um, yeah, there's solid lockup doesn't fail. Um, did you know a couple spine whack tests and stuff like that and i've come up with a new method of that because i think that's kind of kind of archaic but uh I've, i'm coming up with a new method to test out Ooh, I can't the, wait. Strength, the strength of a lock bar i just need to uh purchase one little item and and i should be able to to test it because it's like how much weight does it actually hold how much weight should it hold you know right, right. i want to i want a middle ground i don't want it to just like what if it fails at a hundred pounds versus it doesn't fail at 50 pounds versus, you know, I want a number. Yeah. And then kind of uh, go for that number each time or, or make it. So, so would you say that the lockup and, and that interface between the lock bar and I could see, I think it looks like you had a, a steel lock bar insert yep. in there. I, yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, take so, it apart. I wanted to take it apart. So I'm going to sure. take it apart really quick. Would you say that the, um, <clears throat> coming up with the lock geometry and all of that, was that the most difficult part of this whole process of learning how to make a folder or what, what was the hardest part? I think the hardest part was like, and it may be weird. It's like making fixtures for all this stuff. Cause you gotta like, you have to hold down all the metal. Some that's, you know, somewhere in the machine where it doesn't move and it, mm -hmm. it's, you know, strong enough to, to be machined at those, under those conditions. So I think that was the hardest part of all of this was designing that, but the also the fixtures, but also, yeah, I like, and I don't want to come off as like uh, an a-hole, but there's a lot of people out there that will tell you how to do it. And they have never, you know, made a knife or machined anything. And I definitely take that advice. Like, you probably know more than I do about taking apart knives and stuff like that. So I'm going to take that, 
but also I'm going to research it and like look up to see what the best option is. And that's what I did. But, but as far as actual design of the knife, yes, it's definitely the lock interface. Um, so yeah, we have inside pockets, you know, uh, probably made in the USA as, as, uh, engraved on the inside of this pocket. Nice. Um, so, so we're looking at one scale. We're looking at the show scale. Yeah. This uh, is the show Alex scale. Take, he has taken apart the Lumia <laughs> and the show scale, uh, titanium is nicely milled out very heavily pocketed. And in one of the pockets, it says proudly made in the USA. And then this is what the other, the lock scale looks like on the inside. So I had different pockets on the top, but the machining just took way too long. So I was like, let me just use circles. So, and it uh, afforded me the opportunity to put the serial number or the, the, the make number inside this little pocket right here. I don't even know if you can see that. Yeah, so that's yeah number, I can see that's, that. All right, that's number five, and this has been like the guinea pig right here. So everything is super simple. So it like indicates on these pins and one X as the lock bar or the lock stop or the mm -hmm. blade stop. And then the other one just indicates this and you pull this off and then you have your backspacer. And both of these are screwed from either side so the show scale and the lock scale so you would unscrew this <clears throat> and then this just comes right off pretty simple and yeah. then like i said it just slides right onto there so that's just the piece that holds everything in there and then so you got that and then this guy right here is the lock insert um i may redesign this in the future but um it it's pretty big like it's a pretty <laughs> big piece of metal like i needed i need to make this look a little bit better but this just unscrews from the other side and the good thing about this is that the detent isn't pressed into the steel it's pressed into the titanium but also the uh, lock bar insert is kind of indicated. I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of oh, indicated yeah. on these studs right here. So this is where the detent ball is. And then there's this other stud over here. So then this guy just slips right in. And wait, wait. It's so, so the detent, the detent ball is sitting at the top of that one locating post. Yep. Oh, that's cool. That's a great way. That seems like a great way of doing it. What's the benefit yes. of embedding that in the titanium and not in the steel itself? It's going to hold a little bit better. I have had uh, detent balls fly out, though, if you don't push them in far enough. Mm. But the hold is there. And I think I may, eh, depending, um, it'll be easier to replace, too, um, okay. if I need to replace it. But, uh, you could put it in the steel, but I mean, I read things that the, it, it could fall out. And if you don't have the steel at a certain hardness, it, it won't mushroom in there or form in there. Whereas so titanium, you just press it right in there. Yeah. I was going to say the softness of the titanium <clears throat> kind of uh, accepts yeah. it. And so uh, something I'm, I'm really excited about the, the Lumia is um, first of all, uh, we're, we're a bunch of, of, uh, Greek mythology nerds in my family, especially my girls, they know, <laughs> I'm sure they know about Lumia. I, I did not, but so it's, I, I like the name of course, but uh, I like that. Um, now don't get me wrong. I'm e equal opportunity. I love flippers. I love bearings. Don't get me wrong, but I love phosphor bronze washers and a, and a slow roll action even better. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's something that, that this knife in particular is exciting to me. Uh, it, it, it's just really dialed in on that level. It seems dialed in. I mean, I'm assuming because it's yours, it's dialed in, but it's, it's, it's not going for the falling shut on your finger necessarily. It's, but it's, it looks like a smooth hydraulic kind of Sabenza like action and build. And, and that's the funny thing about all of this is like, and I may get crucified for it, but the only expensive knife that I've owned, well, other than recently, is a strider and 
I know there's a lot of dividedness on, you know, Strider and quality and action and all that other stuff. Um, for what that knife is, I think it's a really well-built knife. But then there's people that have, you know, like CRKT and I've held a ton of hinderers. So I know how that action is, but like, I've never held a CRKT. So I have no idea when people talk about, you know, hydraulic folding action on washers. And I'm just like, well, let's figure it out and let's see if it's even close. So I don't really know. And even the tier of like, you know, what, price range all these knives fall in and what quality pe people are expecting so i know people talk a lot about tolerances and stuff like this and that's fine <laughs> um but i don't know the tolerance of like a crkt by like looking at it. i know that they're probably pretty tight because you mean chris a, reeve knife crk chris reeve knife? Or, yeah oh. i'm sorry CR crk okay. i know that they're probably really tight because a i watched videos on how you made made them and he's talked about it and i know that tim has also talked about it as well um as far as hinderer i know that you know things are very tight on their end because they have you know computerized measuring machines and cmms and stuff like that so all that aside i don't know what people are expecting so i just need to design this and make this with the best knowledge that I have in comparing to all of these. Now, I recently was privy to obtaining a Shirogorov, uh F95, and holy cow! If if that's what we need to hit, then <laughs> damn it, let's do it. But um, man, that knife is amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, my buddies have sent me other knives by other makers and and I get it. I get why things are at a certain price point and I get why things are the way they are. Um, so I just want to be on the same playing field, but I also want to offer, you know, my uniqueness to all of this as well. Yeah. And, and would you say that your uniqueness <laughs> is your grinding, your heat treating, your design and your steel choice? I would I guess, say that I guess that's for everybody, but you are known for your heat treat and your grinding, <laughs> which is weird because there's so many other guys that are way better at heat treating than I'm not saying that I'm crappy at heat treating, but there are so many guys out there that take it to the next level and really like they really take the time and dial things in step by step by step, like to the nth degree, like they know, you know, this needs to be at, you know, 2000, you know, 155 degrees and they get that repeatability that they like but i'm you know i'm aiming for just a one point range and that's way better than what we're getting from you know other places um but yeah i i would think that that's something i i definitely bring to the table and then like the also like <laughs> somebody it was funny somebody mentioned like well you're clearly directly competing with with uh dan Dan Osborne and his Roosevelt knife. So, and I'm like, but I'm not though. Like I even, first of all, I don't even know the guy. I've never talked to the guy in my life. And secondly, I don't care what other people are doing yeah. <laughs> because the bottom line is knives are all going to look the same at some point. You know, people design based off of, you know, their tastes or their, you know, what they see and um like when you had uh names blanking the uh a ken onion on he was talking about designing from animals he would just pull animals and that's how he designed i designed similar similarly but i also will take little aspects of you know things that inspire me like having the hole or you know having a lock bar insert or things of that nature mm -hmm. so it's like I want to bring all these uniquenesses to the table and I just do what people are doing, but do it differently, I guess. So I, I mean, there's some knives that are just fully anode. Like this one right here is, is not going to, it's going to be, this is going to be your, your color, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not, like your, that not your color choice, but just having that little splash of color and yeah. that's it. That sort of thing. So 
I love it. And it also creates a canvas. I know that's kind of a cliche, but uh, I, I, I just got something back from the knife modders. It's, it's a very simple titanium knife and I got it back and it's beautifully, uh, you know, so if, if you, if you care to do something like that, that sort of blank canvas is a, is a, you know, it's a good opportunity to, to make it your own. And it's uh, funny you bring that up. Cause that's actually what I've thought about doing with all of these is like, I know a lot of people want a customized knife and I don't, I don't want to offer that. Like, I, and I don't want to be like crass about it. It's just like, it's not something I'm interested in doing, but there are a ton of modders out there that I know that are my friends too. So like the knife modders, like I talk to those guys yeah. almost every day and to give them something like this, to just, there you go. That This is what you get to mod. And it's just like, yeah. yes, like finally I don't have to like take off orange peel or I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that. And it's just like, it, like you said, a blank canvas and and then now the customer is the artist yeah. because then they can relate it back to the, the knife modder and then they can, you know, make their dream as far as colors and textures or reality. I just got this back from, from them, the knife modders. Oh, this is uh man. yeah, this was the one, it was a plain silver and they put, they just did beautiful work. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I love, I love that option. I would rather have that option uh, then, uh, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of gaudy, then again, you know, maybe, maybe you don't know a knife mod or maybe you don't want to go that far. So that having that splash, a color is nice in the backspacer and on the, uh, the clip. Right. So let me ask you this. So now you've turned this corner and you're working on this and you're, you're, you're in the R and D process, but you're pretty damn far, uh, into it. And, uh, so once this is dialed in and you start producing it and you start, you know, uh, making them and selling them, like where, where do you want to see this go and how do you want to see this new process affect your company? Um, I've been thinking a lot about it and I'm still thinking about where I want to go, but I still want the whole QCI aspect. I still want to make things better. And I still want feedback from people, but I don't want, I guess I, I want to keep it like pretty simple. Like this, the term that I've learned when I was in college and in, in TV and marketing was the kiss system. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. I want to keep things simple as far as that. And then kind of translate the same techniques that I did on this one and translate it into the next one and so on and so forth. And I already have in my brain uh, a flipper tab knife on bearings that I want to work on as well. So instead of just having this and then making a smaller version or a bigger version, a whole new design, just going right into a new design. Like this is going to be what it is as far as size and then the next one will be what it is as far as size. Like there's not going to be a mini, there's not going to mm -hmm. be you know, an XL. And I want to get into, I want to try my hand at tactical knife at some point. Only because it's something that, to me, it depends on what the design is as far as a tactical knife. It Some appeal to me and some don't. And I want to understand, I guess, because that's like more of a, it's a tactical tool. And I want to understand the design process behind a tactical folder versus something that is just not, not so much show, but like is just designed to just cut. Whereas a tactical folder does in my brain, you know, many different things mm -hmm. like I don't know. I think that those those parallels are are definitely different, and I think a tactical folder has more uses for some versus other, you know, showy, flashy knives. You know, yeah, it's it's like a tactical knife has more uh, requirements. You know, right? Has to, it definitely has to have a good traction plan. It has to have, you know, uh, whatever it is, realistic grip. It has to have a sharp blade. You know, 
wh- right. whatever those things are. But 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 they're a little bit more critical because of the use. Whereas right. it seems like you could have more flexibility in designing just uh, an EDC. I don't mean just an EDC, but something that's not <clears throat> intended to save your life in a you know combat situation. And that's what I want to do is because I had this one this one guy who's a firefighter. He contacted me about the shark, and he was like, "Hey, would this be something that would you know I could take on a job and like you know cut people out of cars with?" And I was just like, ah, "Maybe." And I'm like, "Let me just." let me just do a test for you. So I took a knife and I just dropped it on the ground as high. Like I think I was like standing on a chair or something like that in my garage. And like the, the very tip broke off. And I was like, if you think that this would still benefit you, then yes. But I was like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying yes. Mm-hmm. And he's like, all right, I, I totally understand. Like, thank you for, you know, doing that small test and blah, blah, blah. So I want to offer something that like, so one guy can have this knife for this one guy can have, you know, like kind of down the line, like right. in every day, I guess like a design for every use. Cause there's like steels that are designed for certain uses as well right. and certain hardnesses. So having a knife that also would cater to those that are looking for you know something a little bit beefier or something you know a little bit more elegant then. yeah i mean the 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 firefighter example is the perfect example because you know if he took the shark into a you know fire situation the shark might do fine but the kydex might you know loosen up and and right. the knife might drop out so so yeah for each use uh a a dedicated um a dedicated thought or a dedicated uh you know, purpose in designing it. Uh, so uh, I, I know everyone's going to want to know, and uh, I definitely want to know also. And uh, no pressure, but when can we expect to see the first uh, Lumias kind of uh, going up for for testing so, and sale and that kind of thing? The double disc grinding was quoted to be done by towards the end of the month. Um, so as soon as that gets in, I'll run pocket clips and some backspacers. Um, I'm going to try to get at least like three or four or maybe five ready. Um, and then as far as the purchasing option, I think I may do like some sort of lottery to begin with just because it would be kind of weird just to do a drop because then it would take longer for me to kind of pump through all of these and it would be like another, you know, few weeks. I don't want people to wait anymore. And then as far as pricing, it is up on my inst- one of my Instagram posts, but I had it at 600 and I think I'm going to maybe look at that number again. I have had some people contact me about that, and my thought process behind it was because I'm going to offer a wide range of steel, I kind of want to encapsulate all of that and not have to raise the price every time I use a new steel. Mm-hmm. So the only steels that I would raise the price on would be something like higher in the Nadium. So like a 15 V or maybe 10 V probably not even 10 V probably 15 V and like a Rex 121. Cause I do want to offer these in, in those high, you know, crazy steels yeah. as well. Um, so I'm going to revisit that and I'm going to look at other people, you know, doing these, making them the way I am and kind of revisit that and and take a look at it. And I also want to offer a G10 show scale version. And obviously the price would, would reflect that it would be a a lower price. So, um, but yeah, I want to, you know, make it so the business grows, but also make it so people are happy and people get a fair, you know, fair price on all this stuff. And considering that this is my first knife, it's just like, I don't, I don't know, like, I'm not going to make it a hundred dollars, but it's certainly not going to be, you know, $900, like, a, a, you know, a Grimsmo knife was, it's been $900 for like 10 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but, but remember, this is not your first knife. You've proven yourself uh, a couple of times with these exquisitely, Ground. So, in other words, people have faith in you already, and I think that, uh, right. uh, you know, 
I, I'm sure a vast majority of people uh, who are interested will accept whatever price you set. I mean, may, maybe not whatever price you set, but it. I mean, to me, that <laughs> seems realistic. And I've had it all over the place. Like some people have contacted me and they're like, why is it so low? You need to raise your price. And I'm like, listen, like, I'm not going to do that. And then other people are like, why is it so expensive? And I'm like, listen, it's a lot of work. And you make one. <laughs> right. And, and so it's been supportive in many aspects and questioned in others. So I want to, I want to revisit everything again. Um, like if I were hiring a lot of OEM internally in the United States to make all of this stuff, obviously the price would be, you know, considerably lower. Mm. Um, but the fact that I'm doing everything from the ground up, it's not that I'm trying to just make bank on this. It's you have to, you know, pay overhead and, and inflation is a thing like steel prices have gone up. Titanium prices have gone up. I can't pretend that it didn't. So I, I'm going to wager a guess as well that across the market, everything is going to increase quite significantly mm -hmm. as far as materials. And as far as, you know, newer steels like Magna Cut. I know Tim is running a bunch of Magna Cut knives and I, I would wager that it's going to go up pretty significant. So I want to be as far as pricing in the same realm as everyone else. Now, if I were just cranking out, you know, a bunch of these and, you know, sent everything through Taiwan, then yeah, it would definitely, it would definitely be lower. No question about it. But um, that's something that, you know, I've thought about it. And it's something that maybe years down the line, if I come up with a design and it's super popular and I want to make a lot of them, then that's something that would definitely happen. But <clears throat> I don't know. I kind of want to stick to the, the lower production, you know, higher quality or higher quality that I can produce mm -hmm. type thing. And I want people to get their money's worth and you know, having things like warranties and stuff like that are definitely going to be something that I'm going to stand by. So if anything happens, and that's another reason why I had, you know, this lock insert and I wanted it repeatable is if yep. this thing fails, I can just ship out another one and the customer can install it and be good to go. Well, I, I really understand your, um, uh, your being compelled to, to keep it, to right now prestige pieces and and you might not agree with that uh term but what i mean is that is that each knife you make is exclusive and uh that that uh that increases the value of it. and i'm not talking monetary value necessarily i'm just talking about the value of the knife itself because of the rarity and i can see how you would want to keep your hands in this as much as possible uh moving into the future and then as things can uh can automate more well, then you're you're in an even better place. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's a, it's a yeah, great man. pleasure. And uh, for those of you out there who uh, are patrons, I'm going to be talking a little bit more with Alex uh, on the other side. To, so join us there. Alex, thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast. And we'll talk thank to you. you soon, man. Yeah. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. I am very, very excited uh, to see what what uh, these Lumias are like in hand. I mean, and to get such a close-up look uh, at one assembled, I mean, I've 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 been watching them on Instagram, and I've seen a lot of fixtures and a lot of parts, but this is got a real sense of what this knife is going to be like. And I'm really excited. I'm very excited for Alex. And you can just tell uh, that this man is driven uh, by this mission. And uh, uh, it's exciting to see it unfold through his methodical uh, ways. So I, I can't wait to check that out. Uh, check out other uh, great knife makers here on the Knife Junkie podcast every Sunday. And uh, Wednesday, you can check out the Midweek Supplemental, where I go through new knives in the industry and, of course, new knives in my glorious collection. 
And then Thursday Night Knives, our live feed, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube and Facebook and Twitch. Join us there. Uh, until next time, I would like to thank Jim for work, working his magic behind the switcher and also thank Alex for his time in joining us here. Until next time, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.